Hello everybody. Welcome to Blue Marble Science. Quantum Eraser has made the mistake of trying to take on Bob the Science Guy. As you might expect, this is not going to end up well for QE. Warning! We got another Code 1 stupid alert. Monitor and facial damage is imminent. Please protect the children. Now get out those oven mitts. Push the monitor back out of punching range. And let's get ready to have a little fun. What do you say, Gladys? Uh, my gravity is that I can calculate the trajectory of a bullet. And that works just fine in our world. And every, you know, the other day I, I did a um, video on Quantum Eraser and his efforts to talk about gravity not being a force where he cherry picked about six different scientific papers. Every single one of those papers, two paragraphs later, said that unless an object is moving close to the speed of sound or is, sub, you know, on the atomic Light. level, Einsteinian gravity reverts to Newtonian gravity for all intents and purposes. So I'm very comfortable with Newton. Newton's just fine. Einstein just tells me a little bit more about why it happens. But I don't use field equations to figure out how much of a bullet drop there's going to be at 600 yards. I use Newton. And guess what? I can hit a four inch rock at 600 yards. So that's all I have to say about it. So, Bobby, this is going to be fun. The other day I did a video on Quantum Eraser, moi, in his efforts to talk about gravity not being a force where he cherry-picked about six different scientific papers. This is six erroneous, ipsy dixit baseless, bare assertion fallacies. He didn't support any of this, and he doesn't even know what cherry-pick means. None of these knuckleheads know. We're, we're going to go through them, though. Number two, every single one of those papers, two paragraphs later, said that unless an object is moving close to the speed of sound. Speed of light, Huey, not the speed of sound. Bob simply misspoke like you do very often. Rumpus corrected him, but you didn't get it. Apparently, you don't know enough about relativity to understand that the speed of sound has nothing to do with it. I hope you pick your game up a little bit, bud. This is not going to be pretty if you don't. Or as sub, you know, on the atomic level, Einsteinian gravity reverts to Newtonian gravity for all intents and purposes. So, number one, this is incoherent gibberish. Uh, the conclusion doesn't follow from its premise to begin with. So, it's a non sequitur. But we're going to hold Bobby's feet to the fire here. So, B, 11 erroneous, baseless, bare assertion fallacies. We're going to take a look. So, everyone knows this one. This is George Mooser. Right from Scientific American. That I took from this paper. Einstein, general relativity snapped the wand in two, right? Showing that space time, not an invisible force, right? So he said two paragraphs. So one, two. Oh, congratulations, uh, Kiri. Not only did you cherry pick a line out of this, you cherry picked the entire article. This thing really has nothing to do with, uh, this article has nothing to do with the weak field limits of uh, Einstein field equations and how similar they are to uh, Newtonian gravity. What this is, is, is a, an article by George Muser talking with a fellow named Don Marloff where he's uh, discussing uh, non-locality. But what you would find if you read down toward the bottom of this thing is, uh, I believe these are the last two paragraphs. I'm only going to read a little part of it. Under most circumstances, we can ignore non-locality. You can designate some available chunk of matter as a reference point and use it to anchor a coordinate grid. Once you've done that, the physics looks like it's local, Marloff says. The dynamics of gravity is completely local. Things move in a continuous way, limited by the speed of light. But the properties of gravity are still only pseudo-local. The non-locality is always there, lurking beneath the surface, emerging under extreme circumstances such as black holes. And we could go on to say really fast-moving things close to the speed of light 
or really small things on the quantum level. So even though this is not an appropriate citation in the first place, what Bob said is correct. And the problem, QE, is with most of your citations, if you read the entire article or you read the entire paper, you'll find that what you've done is taken a single sentence or part of a paragraph and twisted it to suit your own purposes. So what else you got? The next one is from Caltech. Einstein came up with the theory of general relativity in 1915, the prototype of all modern gravitational theories. Its crucial ingredient involving colossal intellectual jump is the concept of gravitation, not as a force, but as a manifestation of the curvature of space-time. So let's take a look. We'll do a keyword here. It saves an enormous amount of time. Just be patient with me. Go paste. Okay, general. The pro okay, here we go. The prototype of all modern gravitational theories. It's crucial ingredient involved with colossal jump. It's concept of gravitation, not as a force. So this is my citation, right? We're going down to two paragraphs from that. Okay, what we're looking for here again is some atomic uh, and atomic particles, the speed of sound, and Einstein reverting to Newton. So let's go with. Let's see if we can find new. What's it? These Einstein field equations, Newton, in which a body of pre... Oh, sorry about that. Previous G, constants G, is Newton even mentioned in here? No. Some atomic particles? No. The speed of sound? Oh, there's Newton. Einstein also replaced the Newtonian law of motion by the statement that free test particles move along geodesics. Uh... I, I want to spend some more time here, not today, but... Uh... Yeah, uh-oh, QE. You almost made the mistake of reading that last paragraph down at the bottom of the page here. The one that says, Einstein provided 10 equations relating the metric, a tensor with 10 independent components describing the geometry of space-time to the material energy momentum tensor, also composed of 10 components, these Einstein field equations in which both of the previously mentioned constants, g, that would be gravitational constant, and c, that would be the speed of light, figure as parameters and replace Poisson's equation. Hmm. Einstein also replaced the Newtonian law of motion by the statement that free test particles move along geodesics. Uh-oh. That's the shortest curves in the space-time geometry. Yeah, I see why you didn't really want to go there, QE. Maybe we'll get back to that. Uh, Bubby, it says nothing. Oh, and this constant G, uh, this G, big G, doesn't occur in Newton's universal law of gravitation, by the way. Only G just did appear in your very own citation, QE. And here it is again from Warwick Science Department of Physics. See the G right there? That would be Newton's gravitational constant. Or if you want to go to physics info, you can find G right there again. Uh, hmm, universal gravitational constant. You can look it up in Wikipedia. Uh, you can probably stop a third grader on the street and they'll tell you. G actually is in Einstein's equations. Imagine that, QE. So then we have this handy little paragraph from your very own citation, QE. Despite the great contrast between general relativity and Newtonian theory, predictions of the former, that would be general relativity, approach the latter, that would be Newtonian theory, for systems in which velocities are small compared to the speed of light and gravitational potentials are weak enough that they cannot cause larger velocities. I believe that's what Bob said. This is why we can discuss with Newtonian theory the structure of the Earth and planets, stars and stellar clusters, and the gross features of the motions of the solar system without fear of error. In other words, we can treat gravity as a force. Number three, but I don't use field equations. This is going to be good. But I don't use field equations to figure out how much of bullet drop there is going to be in 600 yards. Yeah, yeah. You know why you don't? Because you couldn't tell the difference between your ass and a pipe wrench, number one. And number two, there are no known solutions for any of Einstein's field equations for two or more masses, folks. So between your bullet and the earth, you ain't going to use this. Why? 
because according to you, that's two or more masses, right? From your alma mater wiki, as the field equations are nonlinear, we're gonna get, get to this here in a minute also, they cannot always be completely solved without making approximations. For example, there is no known complete solution for a space-time with two massive bodies in it, which is a theoretical model, yeah, whatever. Do you, do you understand what they're trying to tell you? No, Kiri, I think Bob understands it completely. I think you're the one that's having a problem comprehending it. Let's use your exact citation. This is straight from the Wikipedia article. The solutions of the Einstein field equations are metrics of space-time. These metrics describe the structure of space-time, including the inertial motion of objects in the space-time. As the field equations are nonlinear, they cannot always be completely solved, that is, without making approximations. For example, there is no known complete solution for space-time with two massive bodies in it. Now, are you trying to tell us that a rifle bullet is a massive body? Because what they're talking about here is something like a binary star system, for example. However, approximations are usually made in these cases. These are commonly referred to post-Newtonian approximations. Even so, there are numerous cases where the field equations have been completely solved, and those are called exact solutions. That would be your rifle bullet, buddy. But then there's this other inconvenient little feature of your citation down here. As well as obeying local energy momentum conservation, the Einstein field equations reduce to Newtonian law of gravitation, where the gravitational field is weak and the velocities are much less than the speed of light. That's exactly what Bob said. And oh, by the way, there's that damn G again. Are we ready? Listen, yesterday when I was tweaking this presentation, you know, the final tweaks, Somebody had to send me a video, Ranty's video, of Bob, the pseudoscience fallacy guy. They had to do it, right? Had to interrupt me. So, and I got in late, and all I heard him talking about was the stupid gyro compass. Just because gyro compass, that means the earth's spinning. You know, this 2015 nonsense. So, we're going to go ahead. Let, let's pummel Bob one more time. I mean, he, he's like twice and three times dead. But let's go ahead and do it anyway. Nathan, go ahead and play that. That's from 1607 and stop at 1617, please. This. And here is a, an example of a Sperry gyro compass. These are marine <laughs> compasses. They do not rely on the magnetic poles of the Earth to find true north. That's fine. All right. Is it up? Yep. So Bob, the pseudoscience fallacy guy, Mr. Cygnus Octaris, that's where he said in this presentation, he said that. It's so funny. Hey, Kiri, you remember trying to say this number? How many feet are in 128.3 miles? Answer, 600,707,424 feet. So 600,777 or 600,077,424 or feet of vertical drop must be negotiated over a thousand miles on earth. <laughs> 677,424. Even a dumb hillbilly like me can say it, Kiri. Apparently you don't have any room to talk now, do you? So this is what he said. And here's an example of this very gyro compass. These are marine compasses. They do not rely on man magnetic poles of the earth to find true north. I, I nearly fell off the chair. What chair, Kiwi? Did it look something like this one? Right? Like I need to provide citation for this? I mean, anyone that's done any land navigation knows what the score is here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. It took me less than a minute, right? So, gyro compasses. This is how stuff works. Gyro compass. A spinning gyro compass, if supported in a gimbaled frame and spun up, will maintain the direction it is pointing toward even if the frame moves or rotates. In a gyro compass, this tendency is used to emulate a magnetic compass. At the start of the trip, the axis of the gyro compass is pointed toward north using what? Magnet magnetic compass, we all know this. You said they don't rely on this magnetic. Yes, they do. 
That's how they know to point north. Jesus Christ, Kiwi, you dumbass. You really have got a problem. You went and looked up one of these when Bob was talking about one of these. Chihuahuas do better research than you do. A motor inside the gyro compass keeps the gyroscope spinning. So the gyro compass will continue to point toward north and will adjust itself swiftly and accurately even if the boat is in rough seas or the plane hits turbulence. Periodically, the gyro compass is, is checked against what? Well, the only thing it can be checked against, the magnetic compass to correct any error and, and it might pick up. I mean, so a gy let me explain this. So a gyro compass is set at the start of the trip by a magnetic compass, Bob. They then convert magnetic north, that's the azimuth, to true north. It's very simple. You use magnetic declination. See the map legend. And depends on your start location. The gyro compass is also checked for accuracy periodically during the tri trip with a magnetic compass, Bob. Why and how? Well, number one, to ensure accuracy, especially over long distances. Why? Because your magnetic declination changes. Over short distances, it's no big deal. But if you're taking, if, if you're in the Navy and you're traveling across the ocean, you need this. You need to change it. You need to check this periodically. They add or subtract the magnetic declination from the magnetic azimuth to get true north. Bob's a certifiable bum sniffing retard. Oh, and by the way, there's only one magnetic pole, Bob. Wrong, Kiwi. There is no such thing as a magnetic monopole except in the super weird quantum world and only then was some really weird stuff called spin ice. We're not going to get off into that today. What you looked up is a heading indicator, this thing right here. We use these in aircraft because they are gyroscopes that are designed to mimic the indication of a magnetic compass. They have the advantage of not responding to turbulence. They can bounce around quite a bit inside an airplane and maintain a steady reading. I ought to point out that these things have to be specified for northern hemisphere or southern hemisphere and adjusted preferably for the latitude they're going to be operating at because if they're not they will process and they will process due to guess what the rotation of the earth what bob was talking about is a gyro compass this thing they were patented in the late 1800s and they have been in production since the early 1900s they don't depend on being set by anything. They set themselves. Let me read a little bit of this to you. You can look it up yourself. A gyro compass is a type of non-magnetic compass, which is based on a fast spinning disk and the rotation of the Earth or another planetary body if used elsewhere in the universe to find geographical direction automatically. They find true north as determined by the axis of the Earth's rotation, which is different from and navigationally more useful than magnetic north. Gyro compasses are not set. They align themselves with the axis of rotation of the Earth. They depend on that rotation to induce precession in the gyroscope which is what maintains alignment. Gladys can figure that out. <coughs> you know, Kiwi, you remind me of a guy named Biff. I'm pretty sure you're full of the stuff he's covered in. Hey, folks. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't forget to uh, hit the like and subscribe. It's those little buttons right down there on the bottom. And we'll catch you on the next one. Hey, Gladys. We're out of here.